querido siempre. Nuestros jóvenes se lo agradecerán profundamente. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Vamos a pedirle a nuestras autoridades pasar a las butacas de aquí enfrente porque vamos a iniciar con esta conferencia plenaria de cómo se logran los avances en ciencias. Sin más preámbulo, los dejamos en compañía del doctor Douglas Ocheroff. sunset uh, and, and quite a pretty picture but but what I really need to say is that by their very nature those discoveries that most change the way we think about nature cannot be anticipated how then are such discoveries made and are there research strategies which can increase one's probability of making such a discovery let me illustrate this with a linked chain of discoveries and inventions starting with this person here. This is Hagee Camerleonis. Camerleonis was in a competition with Dewar at the turn of uh, the 19th century to see who could first liquefy the lightest and most inert of the atmospheric gases. It looked like uh, Dewar had won when he succeeded in liquefying hydrogen. But, but eventually, Camerleonis was able to acquire a substantial amount of helium gas, which was very rare at that point. And so he decided to liquefy the helium, and then, which he did, he liquefies at a temperature of about 2 Kelvin, and, and then he pumped on the vapor above the liquid helium in order to cool it further uh, to see where the liquid solidified. Now he tried this experiment for several months, however the liquid helium never solidified. Indeed, I have cooled liquid helium down to a temperature of one ten thousandth of a degree above absolute zero, and it stays very happily in the fluid state. The reason for this has to do with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and the very light nature of the helium atom and its inertness. Uh, so eventually, Camerleonis decided to try to answer some other interesting question of the day uh, using his fancy uh, refrigeration devices. And people had argued about what would happen to the conductivity of a very good metal if you could cool it all the way to absolute zero. Uh, one argument was that as you cooled it, the conductivity would increase uh, to a higher and higher value. But the other argument 
uh, suggested that as you cooled it, eventually the conduction electrons, which were free to roam around the interior of the metal, would recondense on the ions for which they had come, and all electrical conduction would cease. So, Camerlionis got a very pure sample of mercury, and he gave it to his associate, Gio Holtz, and asked him to measure the electrical resistance as he cooled it down. And at first, in fact, it appeared that as he cooled it, the electrical resistance dropped rather steadily. But then, at a temperature a little bit above 4.2 Kelvin, there was a discontinuous drop <coughs> in the, in the uh, resistance to a value of less than 10 to the minus 6 ohms, the lowest resistance that had probably ever been measured at that point. So the reason, the, the, we now understand the reason for this drop was in fact that mercury becomes a superconductor at a temperature of about 4.25 Kelvin. So this drop is in, in fact due to the fact that the helium, the, the uh, mercury became a superconductor. And of course, we've been studying superconductivity ever since that time. So let's look at the relevant research strategies that allowed uh, the, this discovery uh, by Camerlionis to be made. First, use the best instrumentation available, and he had created this series of refrigeration devices which allowed him to actually study matter at lower temperatures than had ever been seen. Don't reinvent borrow technologies you can. Uh, Dewar had invented a Dewar flask in order for him to cool to lower temperatures, and Camerlionis did not hesitate to borrow this technology from his bitter rival uh, and, in fact, use it uh, to his advantage. Look at I'll let the translator catch up. I apologize. Uh, look into an unexplored region of the physical landscape. When you do that, that's where you could expect to see new behavior. And finally, uh, failure might be an invitation to try something new. And I'll, I'll illustrate that in a minute. In a minute but. Finally, beware of subtle, unexplained behavior. Don't dismiss it. And I don't know how many people have, to, have seen something that they didn't understand and dismissed it as being an artifact of their measurement. Okay, this is someone that I actually knew uh, who did his best work uh, in the 1930s, actually. Uh, but he shared the Nobel Prize in 1978. This is Peter L. Kapitza, uh, who uh, measured the viscosity of liquid helium uh, to uh, temperatures of order 2.17 Kelvin, below 2.17 Kelvin. And what he found was that the viscosity was vanishingly low. It essentially was a superfluid. This is the first time uh, that that term had ever been used. And so, uh, for this work, uh, Peter Kapitza, much later, his work was done in 1934, I believe, and he was awarded the Nobel Prize. He shared the Nobel Prize, actually, with, with other gentlemen in 1978. So I suppose if, if good advice for you is that if you're going to make a discovery, make it early in your life. So the two people that, that uh, Kapitza shared the Nobel Prize with uh, were people that I knew from Bell Laboratories. This is Arno Penzias, and when I was a research scientist at Bell Laboratories, Arno Penzias was my boss's boss's boss. So that shows how low I was in the organization. And, but Penzias and his sidekick, Robert Wilson, uh, decided to look at the heavens. Basically, uh, this all started uh, with Carl Jansky back in 1933. Uh, Jansky was asked to find out where radio noise was coming from that seemed to interfere uh, with uh, the possibility to have radio telecommunications. So this is Carl Jansky, and he's made a, a uh, 
the directional antenna that only is sensitive to radiation coming down from the heavens. So, so he did that, and of course he did see a signal. Uh, that was the start of something. Dijansky did not win a Nobel Prize, but in fact, he pointed the way for other people. This is another piece of, of equipment uh, that AT&T built. Uh, this, this was uh, when AT&T was looking into the feasibility of, of sa uh, satellite telecommunications, that is, beaming a uh, signal up to a satellite, and then the satellite rebroadcast it down to this horn antenna. Uh, the, those uh, early, I don't know if any of you remember those early uh, uh, attempts at, at telecommunications uh, via satellites, but there was a long pause because it takes quite a while for the radio waves to make it up to the, the satellite, which is 22,000 miles above the Earth, and then it had to come back down. So, Penzias and Wilson decided they wanted to use this receiver to look at, at uh, microwaves coming uh, from the cosmos, essentially similar to what um, Karl Jansky had done, but with much more sophisticated equipment. So, uh, they used a very fancy preamplifier that, that would really, its existence depended on this person here, uh, this is Charles Towns. Charles Towns actually received the Nobel Prize for inventing the Maser uh, in 1964, uh, but in fact he actually did that work in 1954. Charles Towns is now, I think, something like 97 years old, and he's still doing science, a real inspiration for people like myself that are getting old. Anyway, this, uh, this was not the, the, the kind of maser amplifier that would work for this purpose, uh, but in fact that was modified and ultimately Penzias and Wilson were able to look at various places in the sky and, and they found that the radiation coming from outer space it was, was position dependent on the sky. Uh, so in fact, uh, if you looked at this radiation as not a function of position, but as a function of wavelength, uh, this is the intensity as a function of wavelength, it uh, traced out a, a really beautiful curve, and this curve is, is uh, what we call a black body curve. The intensity of the radiation versus the wavelength is exactly what one should get for a black body at a temperature of 2.725 Kelvin, that is uh, two degrees above absolute zero. But we're not done, and this is a remarkable field. It all happened uh, over a period of, of, of uh, most of it uh, over a period of, of a couple of years, but in fact, the entire thing took perhaps 20 years to do all the technologies. So this is the anisotropy in the cosmic microwave background radiation. What is found is that if you look at the direction of that radiation, uh, of the direction that the Earth is traveling, uh, you find that is hotter, and in the direction away from, uh, the, the direction that the, the Earth is traveling away from, in fact, it's a bit colder. This is just due to the Doppler shift because of the fact that the Earth is moving at a substantial velocity. So it was easy to get rid of this dipolar effect. And then one found, in fact, that this, uh, this radiation, uh, which we believe that even already was radiation left over from the Big Bang, just uh, 4,000 years after the Big Bang, uh, that, that that radiation was, was blotchy, suggesting, in fact, that the, the radiation, uh, the density of, of matter in the universe at the point where that radiation separated from the matter uh, was, its, was uh, itself uh, 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 not uniform. So ultimately, in fact, we got this picture of outer space showing uh, this is, in fact, the, the variation of the temperature of that radiation, but that uh, uh, can be used to determine the fluctuations in the density of matter in the universe just 4,000 years after the Big Bang. Quite a remarkable thing for human beings to have done. 
So let's look at the relevant research strategies that allowed this discovery to be made. First, use the best technology available. That included, of course, the, uh, the Maser amplifier, which is a very key piece. The, the receiver that Penseus and Wilson used, borrowed from AT&T, uh, always use the best technology. Don't reinvent the wheel, borrow if possible. So, as I pointed out, this, this uh, 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 microwave receiver that Penzias and Wilson used uh, was really borrowed from AT&T. Looking to a region of parameter space that is unexplored. This is really where interesting new physics is likely to be found. And finally, and maybe most importantly, I'm letting, I'm letting the translator catch up. Okay, so uh, understand what your instrumentation is measuring. If you see some very strange signal that you don't understand, it's very easy to say, well, this is some artifact of my equipment, and it's really not something I need to worry about. Understand what your instrumentation is measuring. So I suspect, or I hope that you all recognize this. This is a picture that I took of the Iguazu Falls at the border between Brazil and Paraguay. Uh, as I think many of you may know, I'm a, a passionate photographer. Uh, I think I should use the word avid photographer. Uh, and so, so I just use this as a backdrop to tell you that the process of, uh, of advancing science often leads to inventions and technologies that directly benefit mankind. How then is such uh, technology, uh, how then, let's see, however it is impossible to know from where the advance might come that might solve a particular problem facing mankind. Uh, for one example, let me give you nuclear magnetic resonance. This is a technique that I used uh, in, in my discovery of superfluidity and healing fruit. So this is uh, Felix Block and W. W. Hansen. So, so Block and Purcell actually. Felix was at Stanford and Ed Purcell was at Harvard. And those two people invented NMR. However, it, it very quickly became useful for other people. And, and that's what this discussion was all about here. So this is a, a pencil, I think that Felix Block actually did this. Uh, these, uh, basically you have a nuclear spin, let's say it's this pencil, and if we tip it, if there's a magnetic field in the vertical direction, if we tip this, this spin, it will process about the, the vertical magnetic field and at a frequency uh, that depended upon both the strength of the magnetic field and the species of nuclei, nuclei that were processing. So for their work in the development of NMR, Felix Bloch and Ed Purcell, now I should say that there's a competition, uh, academic competition between Stanford University and Stanford University of the East, that is Harvard University. <laughs> so, so I can say that there's probably no one here from Harvard University. Don't tell them, I said that. So, so, so Felix Block and Ed Purcell, Felix Block from Stanford and Ed Purcell uh, from Harvard uh, shared the 1952 Nobel Prize for physics for their uh, developments of nuclear magnetic resonance. But ironically, this field is just beginning at that point. Eventually, people looked at organic molecules and they found that, that if you looked, for instance, at, at the hydrogen atoms, there were shifts in the NMR frequencies of the hydrogens owing to uh, the effects of molecular bonding between uh, the, these uh, atoms that are making up this organic solvent. So you get triplets and quadruplets. And this, this really was, I think, a, a, a very key to the, the uh, growth of the importance and power of, of and a nuclear magnetic resonance. 
Okay, the next step was what's called Fourier transforms.